first of all, thanks for the opportunity to say something to you guys. Um, we've been working together for quite a few years, and uh, um, hopefully this will give you some insight into, into the kinds of things we've been looking at. Um, the focus of what I'm going to talk about right now is on the particular problems that arise with parallel and distributed systems, and perhaps most importantly, um, some subtleties around the notion of state and how it's used in verifying and understanding these systems. And um, I don't think I need to remind you, but just to be very clear that we're on the same page, there's these two very classical notions of the state of a system. Um, this one dating back to Isaac Newton, where you assume that the state is a function of a real variable that we call time, which is a little bit of a of a physical fiction, um, but a very useful physical fiction. And the other one is a much more discrete view, which is the kind that's used in transition systems and uh, automata models, where you think of a state as a discrete uh, object and you make transitions between states in discrete instantaneous steps. So these are kind of two, two classical ways of thinking about state. And the question that I'd like to address is, uh, are these really good enough? And I think I'd like to try to highlight some of the problems that arise, particularly with distributed systems, uh, with respect to using these notions of state. So let's consider a really simple example, a train door, okay, where you would like to verify a very simple condition. You know, um, you'd like to verify that um, it is always true. So globally, the expression there which says that it's not true that the door is unlocked and the train is moving. So you want it to always be false that the door is unlocked and the train is moving. OK, very simple criterion. So you can build a program and this is a distributed program built in this uh, coordination language that we call lingua franca, where um, the assumption here is that you know, you've got a little microcontroller in the train door and you've got a microcontroller in the cockpit of the train and maybe you know some other controller somewhere else right this could be a distributed system and um, you have a couple of, uh, of uh, state variables in the program and you would like to use those to monitor the state of the system okay so the question is well what is the state of the system when you've got these distributed microcontrollers right maybe the, the, the there's a controller that knows about whether the train is moving uh, there's one that knows about the state of the door, there's the cockpit that also needs to know kind of both of those state pieces of state information, right? So, so in this lingua franca program, you might have state variables as part of your software components. So you have this uh, uh, moving state variable that's a Boolean that starts out false, and as the program executes, it gets updated, right? And, and, and you have this other one, uh, a state in the door object that it's locked. Right. And uh, that gets updated accordingly. And the question is, um, we're trying to compare these two state variables, but these two software components are running on different microcontrollers. And we're interested in the state of the system. So what does it mean if we say, well, we would like, you know, the state variables to ha satisfy a certain condition, right? the condition that I gave before that, uh, that if moving is true, then locked is, is also true. Right, that's essentially what we want to do. But when these are in distributed systems and they don't actually share a notion of time, the Newtonian time is a fiction. Any clock that I'm using in those microcontrollers is inaccurate. Um, so what does it really mean to say that these two state variables have these values that give me some sort of safety? You can go down deep into the physics and say, well, you know, actually there you know, if these two state transitions are occurring sufficiently close in time, then the order in which they occur is dependent on the frame of reference and it's a moving train. So the frame of references are changing, right? And so um, it, it, fundamentally in the physics, there's a problem there, right? And it's so, you know, you might say, well, uh, well, the state of the system is some physical ground truth about, you know, whether the, the wheels are turning and the you know, is the mechanics locked? Um, but again, you can go down into the physics and say, well, but when again? And so 
it, you know, relying on some physical ground truth is a little bit problematic because we're really we're working at the software level and it doesn't really have access to any physical ground truth, right? It's just variables in software. So, so how do we actually turn this into something that we can trust and, and rely on, right? Um, so, you know, uh, forget, maybe we could just say forget formal. We'll just pretend that, that Newton was, is actually right about time and we'll just say, okay, then, you know, we'll just trust the clock on each of our microcontrollers and say, ah, that's good enough, right? Um, and, you know, for this system, that might be okay, but there's systems where, you know, that are really quite similar for which that isn't okay. And the situations that I worry about are the situations where the order of events matters a lot, okay? Um, if you have Newton's abstraction works just fine when you have continuous variables and things are changing continuously and smoothly, right? Because then the timing precision doesn't really matter that much. If you're a little off in time, you're just a little off in value, but that's okay. But the kinds of systems that we have in software aren't like that usually. I mean, they're making decisions and the decisions make transitions that can be big decisions, not very discontinuous decisions. So, so consider an aircraft door, right? An aircraft door, if it's armed, when it's open, what happens? Well, the slides deploy, okay? So it really matters in what order you do the open door and the disarm, okay? No matter how small your error is, if you get the order wrong, you're screwed, okay? So even though it might seem odd that I you know, invoked Newton and flashed a picture of, uh, um, uh, you know, that uh, uh, alludes to quantum physics problems, it might seem odd that, to be invoking those on these kind of macro scale systems, but the point is that when order matters, um, these things inevitably ri arise at all scales, right? If the order isn't well defined, you can get disastrous behaviors, right? Um, so if you try to implement this uh, cockpit, this, this door controller as a distributed system, so you've got a microprocessor in the aircraft door, okay? You've got maybe an embedded vision system. So right now, today in an aircraft, right, you might notice when the when the pilot issues a command, you know, flight attendants disarm doors for arrival. The flight attendants look out the window and they've received training that says to not disarm the door until there's a ramp. Okay? Well, maybe we want to replace that with a vision system that verifies that there's a ramp there. Okay, so we got this subsystem that's a vision system that issues the disarm command when there's a when there's a ramp there. And we've got a cockpit control where the cock, the pilot can, has a disarm button and a door open button. And we've got a fire detection system in the in the aircraft that will open the door um, regardless of whether it's armed or not. Okay. And we put all of these on a pub sub bus using ROS2, for example. All right. How well is that going to work? My guess is just fine in testing. You're going to test it a lot. It's going to work just fine. But there's actually no semantics to the ordering of these messages in ROS2. And as a consequence, there is a, ri a lingering risk of these messages arriving at the door out of order. And as a consequence, you could get really quite disastrous behavior. And it might be rare enough that it never shows up in testing. Okay. So the question here is, can we actually formally verify this system and show that that situation is not going to happen? And if we just do it on the basis of comparing state variables at some Newtonian time, that might not be good enough, okay? Because it might not be able to guarantee that the order in which things are going to happen is, is correct. So the fabrics that are commonly used, um, you know, pub sub fabrics like uh, uh, ROS, ROS 1 and 2, MQTT, uh, ROS 2 is based on DDS, uh, Azure, Google Cloud, those have actually very little in the way of semantic guarantees about ordering of message delivery. Um, they're, they're not too bad, right? Because it, <clears throat> an individual pub sub channel in ROS 2 
is there is an order preservation in the individual channel. But the problem is when you have converging multiple channels, you have no ordering information anymore. Okay. Um, and this is true of, of actors, which are also widely used. Service oriented architectures also have this property. There's no ordering semantics to a multiplicity of messages. So just to give you a sense that this isn't just an academic curiosity, um, one of the students that I was working with, Sarush Bhattini, uh, did this beautiful study. He took uh, this open source self-driving car um, stack that is very widely used uh, by people in the uh, autonomous vehicles world. Uh, it's called autoware.auto. And he took this automated uh, valet parking demo that they distribute along with the open source software. And he ran, ran a bunch of tests on it. Okay. And he found that um, the vast majority of the time it performed flawlessly. Okay. But if he ran more than 300,000 simulations, he found this situation where he got mode confusion, all right? And I, I want to specifically tell you what the mode confusion was, right? There, there were, it, it's, a, it's actually a big complicated system with a whole bunch of ROS nodes that are doing bub sub to communicate, okay? And there's a little subsystem here where there's a simulation of the vehicle that happens to be in there in the distribution that they give you that you download it, you, it's using LGSVL, which is a pretty sophisticated automotive simulator and that simulator is giving you uh, a state report and a vehicle kinematic state and the state report includes among other things what gear the car is in is it in is it in forward gear or is it in reverse okay and then the kinematic state is the um, measurement of the velocity of the car and he found that in sufficient in a sufficient number of runs, um, the system would get into a mode confusion state where it thought it was in forward gear and its velocity was negative, or it thought it was in reverse and its velocity was positive. Okay. Now, if you think about it, in a car, that could happen, but usually it's an indication that you've had a crash, right? Um, and as a consequence, you might actually write a controller that takes pretty drastic action when it detects that situation. And that would be it, the wrong thing to do because this mode confusion was arising purely because of the um, network delays happening to very occasionally deliver the messages in an order such that it took the system into this unexpected state. Okay, and this was simply a consequence of uh, the non-determinism in the ordering semantics in ROS2, which is true of any PubSub fabric, by the way. So Sarush also then ported autoware.auto to our framework, Lingua Franca, which emphasizes deterministic ordering. So messages are timestamped. Every component is guaranteed to see messages in timestamp order. So it's not a PubSub framework. It's a time-stamped communication framework, and he showed that this mode confusion never happens. So the, the same autoware code just put into this different framework for communication works flawlessly. But you know the fact that this mode confusion occurred only after 300,000 runs of this simulator uh, to get to reliably reproduce it, he, you know, he could run it 100,000 times and not see the error. And you know his argument was, the rarity of this event is worse than if it were frequent, right? Because it won't show up in testing, okay? So the issue here is really a semantic problem. The semantics of the communication fabric doesn't have a strong enough ordering. It doesn't have strong enough ordering properties in order to even define what the order of messages is. Um, so if you look at the train door example, in the context of, um, of uh, answering the verification question, right? We can, we, it, it, the verification question still remains on the table. Even when you've got these timestamped events, now you know that things are gonna happen in order, but now we have potentially a much stronger fabric to work with, right? Because there's a well-defined semantics to the communication and we can then do the verification on the assumption that those semantics will get delivered. So 
So in this case, what happens is because we have timestamps, we do get a global notion of time. Every component sees messages in timestamp order. And so now, even though Newton's model is actually a fiction in the physical world, as long as our implementation is correct, we get something that actually kind of feels like Newton's model. Every component is seeing, seeing things happening in timestamp order. So that makes it a whole lot easier to reason about it, right? Um, and we have timestamped events. We have reactions to those events. We have injection from the outside world of new events that get timestamped when they get injected, okay? And then we have the question of how do we verify that we have uh, a correct design? Okay, so one of the things, so we started working on this, this particular problem with Marjan and her group and um, realized very quickly that there were actually multiple levels at which you could describe this model, this program. And the, the answer to your verification question actually depended on what level you chose. Okay, so it turns out to be a little bit subtle to figure out how to construct a good verification question. So the first one that we tried was uh, logical time semantics. Okay, so what this meant was that we looked at the state variables and their value at each logical time. So at a timestamp, after all of the computations have been done that affect the state, what is the state? Okay, and because we have a timestamped fabric, that's actually well defined, right? It's, so the program defines that. And you can then do verification under that assumption that you're looking at the state variables at that logical time. So you look at these state variables, is the state variable indicating whether the train is moving, the state variable indicating whether the door is locked. And we uh, 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 ported this from Lingua Franca to Rebecca, ran it through the model checker. Okay, there was a sort of straightforward mapping to do this. And this is a pretty trivial problem and so it ended up being a pretty trivial verification question. And we verified that with this logical time semantics, these two state variables could be proven to always be in a safe state throughout the execution of the program under this logical time semantics. Okay, it becomes a trivial, it's, it's a trivial program. So the verification question is trivial. The state machine is shown here. It's got two states, uh, really easy to verify, no scalability problems here. Okay, uh, you can prove this, this safety condition. But we've made an assumption here, okay, an implicit assumption. The assumption is that there's nothing in the system that is affected by these state variables that sees anything but the final value at each logical time, okay? because that's what we've verified. We've verified the final value of each of these state variables at a logical time. It's a distributed system again. So the software is not, you know, the one state variable is getting updated in one microprocessor. Another state variable is getting updated in another microprocessor. There's an implicit assumption that nothing in our physical system is affected by anything except the final values at that logical time, okay? If that assumption is true, then the verification can be can give us confidence in the physical realization of the system. But if it's not true, then what do we have? So, so we then dove into this in a little more detail and said, well, let's look at this at a little more fine grain level. How's the software behaving, right? And in Lingua Franca, the way the software behaves is that um, at each logical time, a number of reactions can be triggered. Reactions are simply chunks of code that get executed and they can get executed in different microprocessors in the system. So they're not going to be executed at the same physical time, right? It's a distributed system. They're executing at the same logical time. It's they're reacting to things at the same timestamp, but they're not executing at the same physical time because it's a distributed system. So we said, well, all right, let's look at the behavior at this event level and see whether the safety condition is still satisfied. Okay, are these, is it in fact satisfied? Now this turns out when you translate this into Rebecca and do the verification, the state machine becomes quite a bit bigger. The verification question is less trivial and it turns out 
it's not safe. Rebecca re reveals a counterexample that shows that if you're able to observe these state variables while, you know, just I, I, let me let me try to make clear exactly what the assumption is, right? So at each logical time, you have a bunch of reactions that get enabled. A reaction is a chunk of code, okay? The chunk of code may update a state variable. The assumption here is that nothing in the system is affected by that state variable until the reaction has completed. So the reaction is the chunk of granularity that we're looking at. Okay, so that's why we call it reaction level verification. Um, we could go a level deeper and go down to lines of code, right? It's this line of code that updates the state variable and maybe the state variable is directly driving an actuator, right? But our assumption here is no, it's the, the state variable will have no effect on the physical world until the reaction is complete. Okay, that's still an assumption, and you need to make that assumption explicit. If you're going to use these verification results, you have to know what assumptions you're making. Okay, so that's the assumption, and that yields a per it's a perfectly tractable verification question under that assumption. The state machine is is bigger than it was before, but it's not big. It's really, what was it, 27 states or something like that. So totally fine, right? For within well within the capabilities of these tools. If you went down to the instruction level, well, you know, well, the line of code, that's probably not a really good level to be working at, right? Because, you know, suppose that the line of code is directly writing to a GPIO pin that's locking or unlocking the door. Well, now you need to really worry. Well, is that really line of code level or or do I need to look at the assembly level, right? And um, now you're going to have to really expand your state machine because now it's going to have to model the microprocessor architecture and how it's executing these individual lines of code. Your, your state machine is going to get gargantuan if you go to that level, right? So um, that would really create a, a rather different kind of verification question, right? But in this case, it was already enough to just go to the reaction level to get a counterexample that showed us that the code is not in fact safe. If the reactions if the effect of the state variable updates can take an effect in the physical world at the conclusion of a reaction okay so um so if you think about it um what have we done well just so far without even going down to lower levels we have one program and we've proved it safe and we've proved it unsafe so which is it is it safe or unsafe how do you decide? Um, you have to know more about your system implementation before you can really know how to interpret these verification results, right? So this has to do really with the value of models. So we've got two models of our software, okay? The state machine on the left, state machine on the right. They're both correct models of the software. The one on the right is safe, the one on the left is not. They're both models of the same piece of code. Okay. How do you use that in practice? Um, so, you know, part of the question here is, well, what is the value of these models? So um, in, in my group, we have a, a very, very basic principle that we work with that is really essential to being able to understand how to use these models, which is that there's a difference between a scientific model and an engineering model, okay? And the way that I characterize it is that, you know, to a scientist, the value of a model lies in how well it matches the thing being modeled. So the question that a scientist would ask is, which of these two models is the best description of what the physical realization does, okay? Um, to an engineer, however, the value of a physical system lies in how well it matches a model, right? What an engineer does is make physical systems that match models. So now I can actually take a whole different approach to this and say, I like this model on the right better than the model on the left. Let me make the physical system conform with the model on the right because I can prove that one's safe. How do I do that? Well, it turns out it's not that hard to do. 
Okay. Um, in fact, it's routinely done in industrial automation. PLCs do this all the time. Okay. They do this in hardware. Um, when a PLC updates a state variable that's going to drive an actuator, it doesn't immediately drive the actuator. The PLC software comes to the conclusion of the periodic cycle, and then all the actuators get driven from the results that were updated by the PLC. And that's in the hardware, okay? So you can build hardware to match these models. That's an existence proof that's you know 40 years old. Um, and if you do that, then you get the tremendous benefit of having a very tractable verification question and a lot of confidence then in your implementation. So um, we think of this approach as designed for verifiability. You pick the model that you would like to verify, and then you make sure that your physical realization matches that model. Okay. Um, and that's a, in in my opinion, a, a very powerful approach, right? So, we in this particular case, it's a rather trivial model. In more interesting cases, it'll be a whole lot more complex. Okay, but then we pick the physical realization. In this case, the physical realization has two parts to it, right? One part is the part that lingua franca satisfies by construction, which is the timestamp semantics that it guarantees in order delivery. So now everything happens in timestamp order, and that makes this a valid abstraction of the program. And then the second requirement is that when state variables get updated, they have no effect on the physical world until you are confident that that is the final value of the state variable for the logical time. Okay, and you the infrastructure has to tell you when you can have that confidence. Right. And if you if the infrastructure provides that, then you've got a beautiful combination of a verifiable program and an implementation that you know matches the verified program. Right? That's the goal. So the conclusion is that really that there's there's an observer problem here in a sense. You can think of, you know, when you update a state variable and it has an effect in the physical world, let's turn that around and think of the physical world as observing the software. And we're going to constrain what it can see. We're going to constrain what it can see to being what we have are able to verify. Right? We don't let the physical world react to changes in the software until some condition that we are confident about has been reached. Okay, so that's an observer. And what we want is all observers to be able to see things that we can define well so that we can verify what those observers will see, right? That's the design for verification question. Um, so I did it in 30 minutes, it's amazing. <laughs> um, comments, questions, thoughts?